This is One on One. We're joined by our good friend, Alan Lambert, who is a Chief Diversity Officer, PSEG, and also President of the PSEG Foundation. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Hi, Steve. How great is it that we are at this place? First of all, Newark Museum. How cool. Oh my God, fabulous and beautiful what right? you've done. Can't believe it. This is one of the uh, cultural, iconic places in the city, right? Oh, yeah. um, real quick, talk about the foundation, the work you do, and why it's part of a larger effort um, from a philanthropic point of view to make a difference. So PSEG, like all corporations in Newark, really support Newark and what's going on. I think philanthropy in Newark has grown tremendously. So we're trying to get into the space that's more about not just the money, but the actual services, skills, how do we help, how do we strengthen, how do we grow the underpinnings. Years ago, philanthropy in Newark was about the kids. It was about what do we need to do. So PSEG focuses on STEM, STEM education. Science, technology, engineering, math. Science, tech, yep. And specifically out of school programs, water botics, kids building robots in water, um, programs about the environment, taking hikes, um, looking at nature, programs about how engineering changes mm -hmm. your life, building, working things with Lego um, in Newark schools. Well, full disclosure, uh, Ellen and I go back a couple of years, uh, and we've been talking about philanthropy for a long time. Uh, PSENG is a supporter of public broadcasting, and we've had a lot of conversations about this, so let's, let's do this. I've often thought, okay, so when Ellen talks about philanthropy, we need to explain to people, people say, oh, you're giving a contribution, you're writing a check. You have a broader view of it because it's a bigger responsibility. And frankly, a lot of the work that we've done with our nonprofit, Public Television Corporation, has been a product of those conversations. Is that philanthropy? That's philanthropy. C collaboration? Taking, collaboration, talking, understanding that neither one of us has the full answer, understanding even the cause of the issue. Um, kids getting into school, full day kindergarten, hunger, even the cause of that is much more than one thing. You don't answer the obesity problem by teaching mothers how to feed their children. Most mothers know how to feed their children. You, you don't just do it with tracks and fields. It's understanding all the issues. And without you and without all of the partners, we never understand all the issues. How challenging is it to talk to other, to talk to other leaders in the philanthropic community who may not have that particular point of view at this moment? It's getting easier. <laughs> One doesn't shut one's mouth. Um, you have to be the person speaking in the room, and you have to be willing to hear what you don't want to hear. So I may think I know the right way to fix illiteracy. I may think this is how we do it. But someone else may see the opposite. If I can't hear them, I can't be a good philanthropist. And the other part of this conversation that we continue to talk about that we're going to be doing a lot of work on in 2016 and beyond is diversity. Right. Talk about that. And it's a big philanthropic piece involved in that diversity and connected to the 350th anniversary of Newark, a big celebration. So the richness of Newark, I've worked in Newark for 20 plus years. It's a little scary. It's a long time. And when Not I, just with PS, with no, other organizations with as well. other organizations, right. Newark, Beth Israel, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Roche, Merck, yes. um, any number of, of organizations. And the diversity of Newark is incredible, both in its history, but even today. Even today, when you look around Newark, the skills, the excitement, the energy seniors bring when they're working with the Barrett Foundation, doing Anna modules, children, what they bring, of course, that's the most exciting. But when you look at Newark, it's always been a melting pot for ideas, for thoughts. The Newark Museum, in mm. and of itself, I'm looking at what you have on stage, I'm thinking, the artwork. okay, the age is so different. But being in Newark and watching Newark grow and watching Newark's people grow and watching Newark's corporate entities grow because they're here is just an expression of diversity. You know, the city at any point in time is a snapshot of who's walking on the streets. So stand there and look. I see tourists every day, tourists who don't speak English, tourists who come up and say, what, you know, where am I here? I see young people coming in to work in the city from New York. It's very exciting. And that's changed. That's changed from, say, 10 change. years ago. Maybe even five years ago. I think maybe even five years ago. And so let me ask you this. From a philanthropic and from a corporate responsibility point of view, what does this whole diversity discussion have to do with what the responsibilities are? I think it changes the message to people that you're giving money to, to be aware of their community. No one works in a, in a isolated silo anymore. 
If you're serving the North community, you're serving who's ever on the street at whatever point in time. If you're serving seniors in Newark, you're serving any senior that walks through the city. Mm -hmm. So when you are a nonprofit working in a silo, going out for the money, you need to do the same thing funders need to do. Talk about what is the problem? Mm -hmm. What is the circle? How, you know, what are 360 degrees of the issue of joblessness or homelessness? It's more complex. Much more complex. You talked about the 360 degrees. I'm going to go back to the 350. The celebration. You like that segue? Right. Uh, that celebration that everyone's talking about, the Newark celebration of 350 years, a year-long celebration right. that really came about. Dr. Clement Price, the, the late, great yeah. mentor to many of us, Dr. Clement Price, uh, talked about it. And you and your colleagues and many others are involved in that campaign. If we could, Jen Eichlin, our executive producer, could we put up that, um, that website of the Newark 350 celebration? Yeah. What is it and how are you folks involved? So PSEG, Ralph Izzo is a vice chair for the committee for the 350th. But PSEG has been in Newark 114 years. So we're here a long time. A lot of the infrastructure for wires and, and electricity and gas are, is our infrastructure. Right. We've been working on the streets for 114 years. We were transportation for a good portion of that. So we are very proud of how long we've been here. Um, we're putting up artwork. We have a photographer in-house who's been photographing Newark buildings for 40 years. He's doing an exhibit. We're supporting the Newark Museum. It's exhibits. We're supporting NJ Pax. Uh, programs. We are also creating a film called The Hundred Newark People. Hundred Newark People. We've been talking about this for a while. What is that? So we are going to interview a hundred people from across Newark. Um, people who are living today from leaders to students to young children to seniors and talk about their experience in Newark and we'll be creating a video, a hundred snapshots of two or three minute videos each, and then a hundred portraits of each of those people. Where will they live? Um, they will live across the city in every ward. Um, some of them may be people who work and live in Newark. One or two may be people who work. They will not all be the, polit the head politicians. It won't just be people you know, in high spots. It'll be people who've lived here all their lives. And, and the idea is for other people to see that, meaning they're online videos, they're, uh, right. and obviously will take those videos and try to make uh, some sense of them in, in terms of programming I mean, as well. It's who are the people of Newark. We did it at PSEG to show who we were, and we found we were people from Africa, from Costa Rica. You mean we 100 people of the corporation? We did 100 people of the PSEG Foundation, and not everyone was an engineer. One man worked on cars. He came from Africa, and he now works at PSEG. We think we know. We, we it's it's also diverse. It shows it the is. diversity. Right. You and I may look a little alike. We may have both have gray hair. We're so different. We um, assume a lot. We do. We assume a lot. And the beauty of Newark and the beauty of 350 years, you know, you stand on the shoulders of the people who came before you, is that however alike we look, we're so different and we're so all creative and we all add to what is this wonderful city. I have to ask you this. Um, you know that we've been uh, talking, we talk about leadership offline as well. Yeah. Um, but when I have leaders, from either the business community, nonprofit community, education community, et cetera, I ask this question. The greatest leadership lesson that you have learned to date that you would want to share with our audience would be the greatest leadership lesson. I'll put you on the spot. You can. It's not me. It's the people who will be following me that I need to pay attention to. You only know you're a good leader when the person who takes your place steps in and you know that they're doing great things, that they're creative. I don't think you can know you're a good leader while you're leading, because if you're involved, you aren't leading. You're, you're there with everyone. There's a, a very old saying, and I don't know who said it. If, you're, if you think you're leading, and there's no one next to you, and you haven't stopped to help anyone, and there's no one behind you, you're just out for a walk. Boy, you got me thinking right now. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. It's okay to think like that. Um, how much do you love what you do? Oh, I think you can't separate me from what I do. I don't. Play that out. I take my work home. I care about the issues I hear about. I read about them. I think about them. The problems bother you. They do. At home. And, and it bothers me that there's no solution. I talk to my family about them. 
Um, and when we find a solution or I see someone whose life we've changed, I feel so much better. That gratification of knowing, people often get caught up in, just a few seconds left, I, I know, I know guys, but you get caught up in the metrics of things, and I understand that. Right. Like how many people do you reach? How many people's lives you change? I'm like. So I want to ask you a question. When you have a great interview and you know it, what were the metrics? I think you know exactly what happens without those metrics. You know, for those who watch this particular program, the whole program, uh, Christina Jackson was on the first half of this, and then Ellen Lambert's on the second half. You're not an actress, she is. She's not a philanthropist. You are, you had the foundation, she doesn't. I'll just say this, and not just because you're a friend, but when you get to do this and you talk to two people who love what they do and make a difference, and they're able to tell their story, it makes you appreciate what you do and you really love your work. I don't know what the metrics are, but I don't really care at that point. <laughs> Thank you. My Thank you. sentiment exactly. You made my job easy. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank the you. privilege. Really is a privilege. That was great. Yeah. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and by the Newark Museum in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at Newark Museum has been provided by Bank of America, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Barnabas Health, Johnson & Johnson, Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, The Fidelco Group, and by the New Jersey Education Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.